All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our information buffet today. We're going to have some fun talking about best practices and updates on free and reduced price meal benefits. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Maddie Parker, and I am the operations manager in the Office of Nutrition Programs and Services. So before we, we, get, we begin, I just want to remind everyone that this presentation is being recorded and will later be posted on our YouTube channel for viewing. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please make sure to get those in the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to all of them at the end. So today's information buffet will act as a refresher on free and reduced price meal benefits, including important reminders when approving household income applications and conducting direct certification efforts. We will also go over the program guidance on this topic that was sent out to the field on March 5th. This presentation will be especially important for confirming, determining, and hearing officials. So before we dive in, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to the different roles. So a determining official is an LEA official responsible for determining children's eligibility for free and reduced price meal benefits. The confirming official confirms the determination that was made by the de determining official. It is not required to have a confirming official when approving applications, but it is strongly encouraged and considered a best practice by our office. The hearing official is an LEA official responsible for making a decision when households appeal either a determination of benefits or a decision based on the verification of benefits. The hearing must be conducted and the decision must be made by a hearing official who did not participate in the making of the decision that is under appeal or in any previously held conference. The determining, confirming, and hearing official cannot be the same person. On this slide, you'll see a snippet of the program guidance that was sent out on March 5th by our office. If you did not receive this entire document, and, um, an email, please reach out to us and we'll make sure that we get it to you just so you can review it in its entirety. It was brought to the attention of our office that some SFAs are approving students for free and or redu reduced price meal benefits based on a hardship or the need of financial assistance. To establish income eligibility for a household, determining officials must compare the household size, the total household members, and the total household gross income to the applicable income eligibility guidelines. If a household completed a free and reduced price income application for school meals and their income is within the eligibility guidelines, then the child or children are eligible to receive free or reduced price meal benefits. If the household income is not within the income eligibility guidelines based on both income and household size, then the children will remain a paid, the children or child will remain a paid student. And again, this is just speaking to eligibility based off of solely income. The School Food Authority Administration cannot override this requirement due to the family seeking financial assistance or based on need. Any student that has had their eligibility changed to free and or reduced due to an administrative approval and not a free and reduced price income application or direct certification efforts will need to be changed to paid status. A household may appeal the denial of benefits or the level of the benefits for which it has been approved for. The household may request a conference with an appropriate LEA or school food service official prior to a formal hearing. The hearing must be conducted and decision ma made by a hearing official who did not participate in making the decision under appeal or in any, any previously held conference. The SAU should refer to the parent appeal rights submitted as part of their NSLP application as well. So benefits during an appeal. When a household appeals a reduction or termination of benefits within the 10 calendar day advance notice period, 
the LEA must continue to provide the benefits for which the child was originally approved until a final determination is made. The LEA may continue to claim reimbursement at the original level during this period. When a household does not request an appeal during the 10 calendar day advance notice period, benefits must be reduced or terminated no later than 10 operating days after the notice period. If the hearing official rules the child's benefits, benefits must be reduced, the actual reduction or termination of benefits must take place no later than 10 operating days after the hearing official's decision. Families should always be reminded that they can resubmit an application at any time during the school year if there is a change, such as an increase in household members or decrease in household income. Administrators submitting applications on a student's behalf. After the letters to parents and the applications have been sent out at the start of the school year, the SFA may determine, based on information available to it, that a child for whom an application has not been submitted meets the eligibility criteria for free and reduced price meals or for free milk. In this situation, the SFA may complete and file an application for the student setting forth the basis of determining the child's eligibility. This may only be done if the administrator has direct knowledge that the student is eligible based on income or they are homeless, migrant, runaway, etc., and that the parent or guardian fail to submit an application or the child or children have not been picked up by another source categorical eligibility official. But again, administration cannot automatically qualify the student for free or reduced price meals. The SAU must get documented permission from the parents to complete the application on the student's behalf. Please keep in mind that if an administrator completes an application on the student's behalf, they are taking responsibility for that eligibility determination. Again, they must have direct knowledge that the student is eligible for those meal benefits, either free or reduced. Proper documentation must be retain, retained to back up the information on this application. Now we're gonna cover additional best practices and reminders for when processing free and reduced income applications. These are going to be areas of the application and direct certification process that have been brought to our office's attention this school year and identified as needing additional guidance on. If anyone has additional questions outside of what is covered during this next part, please put these questions in the Q&A box or feel free to email someone on the NSLP team. First, we'll cover case numbers on applications. If the household checks off yes to someone in the household participating in SNAP or TANF, they are still required to put in their case number. If the box is checked off yes and there is no case number, the application cannot be determined as categorically eligible for free meals and is considered incomplete. To ensure a case number is appropriate for National School Lunch Program and the School Breakfast Program, as a best practice, when the SFA receives an application with a case number that qualifies the student or students for free meal benefits, the SFA should first cross-reference the direct certification list to ensure that student is not on it as the DC list trumps an income application. If the student is not on the DC list, the SFA should contact the family and request request the Department of Health and Human Services Notice of Determination, the NOD, this letter as backup. And this letter can be attached to the application just to have that as additional documentation. Next, we can speak to income frequency. This would be under step three of the free and reduced income application. In application example number one, you can see that both household members earn $700 weekly from work. Since both incomes are received at the same frequency weekly, the determining official would not convert this into annual income, 
but would compare the weekly income of $1,400 to the weekly income eligibility guidelines for a household of three. As you can see, example number one is a household of three. In application example number two, one household member earns $700 weekly and one earns $700 every two weeks. Due to the two household members earning income at different frequencies, the total income would be converted to annual income. Again, income should, always, should only be calculated annually if multiple frequencies are reported on the application. Calculating income annually when income is only reported in one frequency can result in an incorrect determination or denial of an application. Some computer systems may calculate income on an annual basis, but the SFA is ultimately responsible for making sure income is calculated correctly. Another very important item on the free and reduced applications are the last four digits of the social security number of the primary wage earner or other adult household member or indication of no social security number. Applications that are being determined solely based off income must have the last four digits of the social security number completed or an indication that no household member has a social security number. If there is no social security number or indication of no social, the application is considered incomplete and cannot be processed. The SAU may reach out to the family to receive this additional information for the application. As a reminder, all communication with the family, whether email or over the phone, must be documented by the SAU. The social security number is not required when a household applies on behalf of a foster child or if a household lists a SNAP, TANF, or FDPIR case number, or when the household indicates that the household adult member signing the application does not have a social security number. On step four of the application, a signature of an adult household member must be completed. If there is no signature, the application is considered incomplete. Again, when a household submits an incomplete application or their application is missing required information, the household cannot be approved for benefits. The missing information must be obtained before an eligibility determination can be made. The LEA must not delay approval of applications if the household fails to provide any non-essential information. For example, if an application has all the required information for determining eligibility, but the household did not include its street address, processing the application must not be delayed. On page two of the household income application, the determining official will report the total income and at what frequency, household size and eligibility determination. The determining official must sign and date both approved and denied household applications to confirm the determination. For scanned and web-based household applications, the determining official may accomplish this by signing or initialing and dating a sheet of paper that is attached to a batch of household applications or making a note to the electronic file. As a best practice, online household income applications should be printed off, signed and dated by the determining official. The determination should also be written on the printout of these web-based applications. When determining eligibility, it is not required that a confirming official signs the application but this is considered a best practice to ensure eligibility is being determined correctly. Applications that do not have eligibility determinations on page two and or are not signed by the determining official are considered undetermined. During an administrative review, this may be considered a finding. LEAs must have a method in place to process applications from mixed households. 
These are households where some children are other source categorically eligible and some children are not. These applications may result in different eligibility statuses for different children in a single household. After other source categorical eligibility has been determined for the appropriate children through contact with program officials, the LEA must use the household size and income level to determine if the children in the household who are not categorically eligible are eligible for benefits based off income. Additionally, applications must be reviewed in a timely manner. Whenever possible, applications should be processed immediately and must be processed within 10 operating days. This is particularly important for children who are not eligible to receive carryover benefits because they were not certified as eligible for free or reduced price meals during the previous school year. And here are some additional application reminders. If the SAU uses an electronic system as one of their application processes, the letter to households must inform the household how to access the system to apply for benefits. The letter must also explain that the household still has the option to submit a paper application and must indicate how the household may obtain and submit a paper application from the school. And again, the SAU is ultimately responsible for determining applications, not the computer. The SAU should always double check that determinations made by the application software are correct, as sometimes it will compute income at an incorrect frequency. Direct certification reminders. Direct certification allows SAUs to certify children as eligible for free meals using participant data from other programs, and this eliminates the need for an application. Eligibility for free meals ex is extended to all children in a household if any member of the household receives an assistance program such as SNAP and TANF in New Hampshire. And as a reminder in New Hampshire, Medicaid does not directly certify students for free or reduced price meals. It is required by USDA that the DC list be run at minimum at or around the beginning of the school year three months after the initial effort and six months after the initial effort. As a best practice and something that is strongly encouraged by our office, the DC list should be run by the direct certification official around the fifth of every month. This will ensure all eligible children are captured and provided the correct eligibility status. And here are the resources that most of the content was got from. Um, I really utilize the eligibility manual a lot for this presentation. So really make sure the SAU is using this great resource. And here is the non-discrimination statement from USDA. You can find my contact information on this page as well as the rest of the ONPS team. And now we'll take a minute to look at the Q&A box and answer any questions.